There's very little in valuation that I think of as new, different, or sophisticated. Much of what we do has always been done. This session is an exception. I want to talk about the application of option pricing models in valuation. Not to value options, that's been around a while, but to value real businesses. What kind of businesses? Could be an oil company with undeveloped reserves, a young biotechnology company, equity in a deeply troubled company, company losing money with a lot of debt. This session, I hope to flesh out why I think of investments in these businesses as options and what the implications are for investors. So now that we've talked about intrinsic and relative valuation, it's time to turn our attention to the third and final approach to doing valuation, real options. As I noted at the very start of the class, this is perhaps the only area of valuation where we can not draw new and different things, quasi-sophisticated models to do valuation. But in this session, I'd like to cut to the core and talk about the intuition that drives real option valuation. When you do a discounted cash flow valuation, you take the expected cash flows and you discount them back and you come up with a value for the asset, right? Well, for most assets, that is an appropriate measure of value. But you could argue that in some cases, you're going to underestimate the value of an asset, especially when there are the following options embedded in the asset. The first is the option to delay. An investment that looks bad today might become good tomorrow, and having the proprietary rights to that investment can still be valuable. The second is you have the option to expand. You can have an investment that does not look good today in terms of cash flows, but it might give you a chance to enter a new market or create a new product that is incredibly valuable. That is the option to expand. And the third is the option to abandon. In some investments, you might get the right or the option to walk away from that investment if things don't go well. That is the option to abandon. Generically speaking, we're saying that if you have an asset with these options embedded in them, traditional discounted cash flow valuation is going to understate the value of these assets. In fact, when you use option pricing in valuing businesses, you're arguing for attaching a premium to traditional discounted cash flow valuations. So it's good to be clear. Option pricing valuation is not an alternative to discounted cash flow valuation. It's an augmentation. You first have to do a discounted cash flow valuation before you embark on option pricing. To give you an idea of where the value of an option comes from, let me give you a very simple illustration. Let's assume you have an investment where there's a 50% chance you could make 100 million and a 50% chance you could lose 120 million. The expected value of this investment is negative, right? You would not take this investment. Now let's say I took the same investment and broke it down into two steps. In the initial step, you take it in a smaller increment. So in that first step, you get one of two outcomes. Either the investment comes back as a good investment, in which case you make plus 20 million, or it comes back as a bad investment, in which case you lose 20 million. If you lose the 20 million, you stop the investment right away. But if you make the 20 million, you continue. And if you win, you make another 80 million, giving you a total upside of 100 million. And if you lose, you lose another 100 million giving you a total downside of 120 million. If you look at the probabilities, this investment is actually equivalent to the first investment. There's a 50% chance that you'll make 100 million, and there's a 50% chance, cumulatively, that you'll lose 120 million. But here's the magic of options. If you take the expected value of this investment, you're actually going to end up with a positive expected value. A bad investment became a good investment when you took it in two steps. Now step back and think about why the second investment was valuable and the first investment was not. The first aspect that made the second investment more valuable is you got that first try. You were able to observe what happened in that first try, learn from it, and adapt your behavior. In fact, those are the two key words that drive the value of real options. It's learning and adaptive behavior. Let me stop being abstract and give you a real world example. Let's suppose you have to value an oil company. In a traditional discounted cash flow model, here's what you do. You take the expected number of barrels of oil that will be produced each year. You multiply by an expected oil price. You come up with an expected cash flow. And you discount back at a risk-adjusted rate. What are you missing when you do that? If you ra actually ran an oil company, you would not produce the same number of barrels of oil every year. And here's why. You get to observe the oil price first, right? If oil prices are high, you might produce a lot of oil. If oil prices are low, you might cut back on production. 
you have the option to adjust production. There is learning from looking at the oil price and adaptive behavior because you change the production that you have based on that price. That's what you're looking for in real options is is there a capacity to learn and can I change my behavior to make a business or asset more valuable? So here are the three basic questions that I'd like to answer when I think about applying option pricing to value businesses. First, when is there an option in a decision? When should I even be talking about option pricing? So let's start with that question. Second question, when does that option have significant economic value? And this is where you're going to see a drop off in the number of options that you can actually value. Most options that you see out there have either no value or so little value that it's not worth doing this. So when does that option have significant economic value? And the third and final question is, when can I use an option pricing model? Those models that have been developed over the last 40 years to value that option. So let's start with the first question. When is there an option embedded in an action? When should I be using option pricing? There are three specific characteristics that I look for to identify something as an option. First, options are derivative securities. They derive their value from something else. So there's got to be an underlying asset. Second, options have contingent payoffs. Something has to happen for your cash flow to pay off. And third, options have limited lives. An underlying asset, a contingent payoff, and limited lives. In fact, the best way to recognize when you're dealing with an option is to draw the payoff diagram for your cash flows. And if your payoff diagram looks like an option payoff diagram, you have an option on your hands. So very, very quickly, let's review the two type of option payoff diagrams you can face. If you have a call option, you get the right to buy an asset at a fixed price. Here's what your payoff diagram will look like. There's a kink at the strike price. And if your value of the asset exceeds that strike price, dollar for dollar, you make profits. But if the value of the asset falls below the strike price, you don't lose an unlimited amount. You lose what you paid for the option. So you have limited losses below the strike price, potentially unlimited profits above, this, above the strike price. If you have a put option, it's like holding a mirror up to those same cash flows. If the value falls below the strike price, now you lose money. Not an unlimited amount because your price might not be able to drop below zero. But if the value exceeds the strike price, you lose what you paid for the put. So here's how I use payoff diagrams. And in the sessions following, you're going to see this happen. Whenever I talk about a real option, I'm going to first draw the payoff diagram to see if, in fact, I have a call or a put option on my hands. And once I do that, I'm on my way to using option pricing. Second question you need to ask, when is there significant economic value to this option? Let me give you the key word that I think drives the discussion of real options. It's exclusivity. If you and only you can exercise this option, this option has significant value. The less exclusivity you have, the less value there is to the option. Again, this might sound mysterious, but let me give you a very quick anecdote to bring this home. A few years ago, second year MBA came into my office and he was very excited. His landlord had given him, he said, an option to buy the apartment he was renting, and he wanted to use an option pricing model to value the option. I said, okay, what price did he say you could buy this apartment at? The MBA student thought for a while and he said, you know what, he never mentioned a price. So I said, let's get this straight. Your landlord has told you you can buy the apartment you're renting right now, anytime over the next year, for whatever the prevailing market price is, right? And he said, hey, I guess that's what I've got. And I said, what do you think that's worth? Anybody can buy that apartment at that market price. You have no exclusivity, you have no option value. So with every real option, this is a question we'll stop and ask, is there exclusivity? And it's not a zero one proposition. If you have total exclusivity, the total value of the option will come. If you have absolutely no exclusivity, there is no option value. If you're somewhere in the middle, you get part of the value of the option. Now, once you decide your option is exclusivity, then we know what the determinants of option value are, and there are only six. Three relate to the underlying asset. One is the value of the underlying asset. As that moves up and down, the value of your option will change. The second is the variance in that value. As that variance goes up, your options will become more valuable. And this is where asset pricing gets turned on its head. Because up until now, whenever we've talked about risk, we've been very clear, as risk goes up, value goes down in a discounted cash flow model. As risk goes up, multiples go down in a relative valuation. 
But in an option pricing model, as risk goes up, value goes up, and the reason is simple. You're protected on the downside. Remember those payoff diagrams? You cannot lose more than what you paid for the option. So variance and risk becomes your ally. And the third and final characteristic relating to the underlying asset that matters is if that asset pays a dividend, it can affect the value of your asset. If you have a call option on a stock or an asset that pays a dividend, on the day the dividend is paid, the value of the asset is going to drop, which is going to make call options less valuable and put options more valuable. There are two variables relating to the option that matter. One is the exercise price itself. As that changes, the value of the option will change. The right to buy something at a fixed price becomes more valuable at a lower fixed price. And the other is the life of the option. The more time I give you to play the option, the more valuable it becomes. There's only one macro variable that enters the option pricing model, and that's the level of interest rates. And it matters for a simple reason. When interest rates are high, the present value of what I have to pay in the future, remember the price is fixed, becomes lower. So call options become more valuable at higher interest rates, and put options become less valuable. So once you have an option and you decide that that option has significant economic value, we know the variables that drive the value of the option. So let's assume you found an option and you've decided it's a significant economic value. The next question and final question you face is, can I use an option pricing model to value this option? And here we've got to understand the basics of option pricing models. I won't bore you with the details, but here are the two basic principles that govern how we use option pricing models or what drives option pricing models. The first is the principle of replication. What is replication? You can replicate or you can create a portfolio of the underlying asset, neither borrowing or lending, that is exactly the same cash flows as the option. And once you do that, the second principle comes into play, which is arbitrage. If the option and the replicating portfolio have exactly the same cash flows, they have to trade at the same price. So all option pricing models are built on replication and arbitrage. But step back. To be able to do replication arbitrage, here are the things you have to be able to do. You have to be able to buy and sell the underlying asset. You have to be able to buy and sell the option. You have to be able to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. Now, it's difficult to meet all three conditions, but the further away you get from those three conditions, the less likely it is that option pricing models will deliver a fair estimate of value for your option. Now, with that set up, let me lay out the two basic option pricing models you might run into in practice. The first, of course, is the Black-Scholes model, the model that invented option pricing as we know it. In the Black-Scholes model, we make restrictive assumptions about a number of variables. For instance, we assume that options are European options. What are European options? European options can be exercised only at expiration. We assume that the variance of the underlying asset remains fixed over the life of the option. And finally, we assume that the prices of the underlying asset don't have any jumps to them. They're continuous. They move in small increments. They're big assumptions, but if you make those assumptions, you end up with a very simple model. Simple in terms of the inputs you need. In the option pricing model, at least as seen by Black and Scholes, there are only six inputs that drive the value of an option. The value of the underlying asset, the strike price, the life of the option, the riskless rate, the time to expiration, and the variance in the value of the underlying asset. That's it. There are no external variables. So with those variables, you can value any option. But it does base it on restrictive assumptions. The alternative is the binomial model. In the binomial model, you're less restrictive in your assumptions. You can have early exercise. You can even have variances changing over time. But here's the catch. A binomial model requires you to be able to specify the prices at every branch of the binomial model. A lot more information needed to use the binomial model. Now, if you look at real options, and especially at real options books, many of them emphasize the fact that the Black-Scholes model is ill-suited to value most real options. They're right. Most real options have changing variances over time and require early exercise. But having agreed on those terms, I still think that using the binomial model is not an easy choice. All of the information you need for the binomial will often lead you into a dead end. And if you can estimate the entire binomial model, I would argue that there's a far simpler way, using decision trees and basic statistics, that you can value any asset. So let me put it this way. If you have the information to draw the entire binomial model, you don't need option pricing to value an asset. If you don't have that information, you're going to be stuck with the black shoals, notwithstanding its limitations. So let me sum up. Options are a useful tool to have, but to apply them in valuation, 
there are three basic tests you've got to meet. First, you've got to make sure that there is an option embedded in an action. Check for that. Second, check to see if you have exclusivity. If you have exclusivity, you have significant option value. And third, check to see if you can trade on the underlying asset and the option, because only then can the option pricing models deliver an accurate estimate of value. As we'll see, for every 100 options you run out there, maybe two or three will pass these tests. But when they do, it's an interesting way and a useful way to estimate value.